Hi, I am Casey Jumper. I am the children's minister here, so um, I'm not used to being up here, and I'm used to speaking to people who are under the age of 12. So I'm used to that, so I'm a little nervous-sided. It's a word that was introduced to me by one of my Bible drill kids. I was like, hey, how you feeling? He's like, I'm (laughs) nervous-sided. And it's a word I use often because most of the time, when the Lord calls you to do something, you're nervous because it's normally way out of your comfort zone, and you're excited about it because the Lord called you to it, and you know he's going to do something great through it. And so this morning, I'm a little nervous-sided. But to help with that, I need about a third of you to raise your hand sometime in the next 20 minutes and ask to go to the bathroom or get a drink of water. And the other third of you, raise your hand, tell me about a pet, a bruise you got two months ago you forgot to tell me about, or your great aunt Lou, okay? Um, And the other third of you, find a place on the wall and just stare at it the whole time. All right? (laughs) But in all seriousness, um, I'm excited to be here um, and to do this. And so before I get started, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for who you are. You are a God who is enough when we are not. Lord, just use me as a vessel today, and let us all just have ears to hear and a heart to learn. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, so before I get started um, about trying to figure out what I was going to talk about, Ridge goes, you got an idea? And I was like, nope. (laughs) And he was like, okay, I'm going to give you some advice. And I was like, good, I need a lot of it. So he's like, do something you're passionate about. Or do something like a verse that you know really well. And I was like, okay, I can do that. Children's ministry, passionate about that. I can talk about children's ministry, why it's important in the church, or why it's important in the home. Um, I can talk about our vision of belong, believe, become, and how that applies to everyone here. And I was like, okay. And the Lord's like, no, you're going to do something else. You're going to do what I've been working on you. And I was like, well, all right. So today we're going to talk about living with brokenness. This is something that I've been dealing with myself especially the last two years of my life. But um, before we get started, I need us to be all in agreement about something, okay? Can we all agree that the world we live in is messed up, crazy, and broken? Okay, good. Now, why? So it's because it's full of people that are crazy, messed up, and broken, right? And I'm just not talking about the people that you see on the news or in prison or starting wars. I'm talking about us too. Every Christian and believer and do-gooder, we're all crazy, messed up, and broken. Okay, so we all just admitted we're all crazy, right? Okay, good, because I'm crazy, and so I'm glad we can all fit in. So I'm going to show you some, oh wait, before I started, as I was studying for this week, um, I felt um, very comforted by this picture. It says, uh, me preaching kids to kids on, in church on Sunday mornings versus me preaching to adults in church on Sunday mornings. <laughs> okay, I thought it was funny. Anyways, um, I was like, good, I'm not the only one who feels this way that's in my role. So, okay, next picture though. So these next couple pictures are pictures that either bring me joy or great satisfaction. This is my girls, Shiloh and Lydia, at Hobby Lobby, my happy place. (laughs) Um, And then the next picture, that's me and my husband, Corey, at a Skillet concert. Skillet's my favorite band. Love it. So that's there. And then this picture, I don't know whose room this is, but isn't it pretty? (laughs) I love it. Like, everything has its place. I don't know if you can see, but the bins are labeled of what toys go in what bin. And it's clean. It's tidy. I love it. Okay, go to the next one. So this is a picture of a garage. How many of you wish your garage looked like that? Yes. If your garage looks like that, can I hire you to come do my garage here in a couple of months after we move? Corey's already in agreement. That's what ours is going to look like. All right? (laughs) So the next one, oh, the pantry. 
Oh, yeah. Some of y'all are smiling because it's bringing you a lot of joy and satisfaction, too. Yeah. There's TikToks and social media that are designated to pantries to look like this. I, I'm mind blown. Mine doesn't look like this because I know it doesn't because when I get back from the grocery store, I put two cans of Rotel next to the six I already have. All right. <laughs> you all understand. Okay. Next one. Oh, look at that bookshelf. I love it. The color coding, the size. Oh, it just brings me so much joy. I learned something about my personality um, in college is that I'm very A-type personality. I, everything I like has order and there's list in my life and labels and that's just how I function. I, to the point where I'm crazy. In college, my classes were color coded. I would cover my books with a certain color. My folder and my spiral would also be the same color. Like all my ministry classes were hues of like warm colors. Like, history of church was in yellow, Greek was red, all right? And then we had purple, that was my science classes. And then every night before I go to bed, not only was my room tidy, my backpack, my 8 a.m. class was first, all of everything I needed, then my 10, then my 1 o'clock, and then when I was done with my 8 o'clock, I went to the back. That was me, okay? (laughs) I was crazy, And I still feel like that sometimes. I feel like I need the order and the color coding to happen. And then something happened. I got married. (laughs) But my husband's kind of the same way. (laughs) We got married and I was like, hey, can I color code our closet? And he was like, yes. So like the first couple years of marriage, our color, our, our, clothes were color-coded in our closet. Um, And it was, yeah, it was great. Um, And then another thing happened in my life. I had Shiloh. Her closet was the same way. It was in order by size. Then we had the dresses. Then we had the outfits with the pants that were also attached. That was just who I was. The, The bins had labels, and that's how it went. A couple years have passed. And something else happened. It's called a global pandemic. (laughs) We all experienced it. And things happen in everyone's life. But one thing that I think realized that happened the most was we realized things about ourselves we didn't know before. Because we were all forced to stop and look at it. We, we had to stop doing what we normally did, and we were face-to-face with it. And also in that time, I was pregnant with Lydia, and I had panic attacks. I would call my husband in tears all the time. I would leave work and be like, hey guys, I don't feel good. I was pregnant, so I got away with it. And I would go home, and it would hit hard. The questions of, am I going to be a good enough mom for two kids? Am I going to be a good enough wife to my husband? How, how am I going to be able to do all of this, plus keep a t- tidy house and sleep and feed everyone and shower? How am I going to do Sunday mornings when I have to teach. Corey's playing up here. We have a baby and there's not enough volunteers in the nursery. How's that going to happen? I was reminded over and over again, I'm not enough. My desire for perfection and order just crumbled me. And, sorry, I just kind of like went through with all that. I knew someone wasn't going to be happy with me somewhere. And the anxiety, the stress, and the fear would hit me so hard to the point of making me sick. And then in walks scripture and all of its glory. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. His grace is enough. 
It's enough. It's enough to cover my fear, brokenness, messed up craziness. And when Paul was writing this to the church of Corinth, he was quoting Jesus. Jesus said it. He could have easily, Jesus could have said, my grace is enough for everyone. It's true. But he said, my grace is enough for you. I feel it probably one of those Zacchaeus moments. You know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And he was a tax collector and hated by a lot of people. He took money and people, we don't like it when people take our money. (laughs) And he had the pressure of everybody just pushing in on him. And he felt very unloved. And then Jesus walks in to town and he's like, I, I want whatever he's got. So he fights his way through the crowd and realizes I still can't see him. So he climbs a tree just so he can get a glimpse of what Jesus has. And Jesus, walking through the crowd, looks him right in the eyes and says, Zacchaeus, come down. As I was reading the scripture, I had one of those Zacchaeus moments. I had the pressure and the anxiety and the fear pressing in on me, but I was a crowd full of people and no one could see me. But as reading scripture and studying and doing what I do, I'm always wanting to see Jesus. And here he goes and he steps and he says, I am enough for you, Casey. I am enough for you. And guys, he calls you by name too. I don't know what kind of broken, crazy, messed up life you have. Maybe it's fear and anxiety. Maybe you have trouble with um, pride, pornography, addiction, the love of money, of idolatry. Or maybe you have a broken relationship with a coworker, a family member. Or maybe you're in an identity crisis. And I'm just not talking about whether you think you're male or female. I'm talking about what kind of mom are you? What kind of dad are you? What kind of grandparent are you? What kind of boss are you? What kind of church member are you? Or maybe you're, broken with a, you're dealing with a broken family at home. Your kids don't know which way's up. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to tell you, his grace is enough. And that is beautiful, but guess what? The scripture doesn't stop there. It keeps going. There's a second half of that verse. And it says, therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness, so that Christ's power may reside in me. Boast in your weakness. Hold up. The very thing that would bring me to tears, to avoid my friends, my husband, and my daughter seeing me cry... I'm supposed to boast in it? It doesn't make sense. But that's what scripture says. Why would we want to boast in that? And it's because the Lord tells us that brokenness and messed up lives do not discount you. It's the very thing that sets fire to his love to send Jesus to save us. It's the very thing sent Jesus to save us. And most of the time, when we're at our broken pit, that's when we run to the Jesus. We need you. Because I am not enough. And that's when we go to Jesus. But when we boast in our weakness, and we bring it to the forefront of our mind, we don't just go when we're at our broken lowest part. We're there all the time. God's love isn't only when we're at the pit. It's 24-7. All the time. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to be in a relationship with him when we're constantly talking to him about when we need him the most. And we're constantly reminded of his grace. When we are at his feet, allowing him to use his power in us. 
I'm not talking about boasting and walking around and being like, unclean, unclean. Okay? Because everyone will go the opposite direction. But what I'm talking about is owning up to it. It's easy to own up to our stuff that involves other people. I hear it all the time in children's church. Hey, how many of you guys sin? Oh, I do. All right, what kind of sins? Well, I hit my brother. All right. I disobeyed my mom. Okay. Well, I lied to my teacher. Okay. All of those things were directly involving someone else. There was accountability there in those sins. But sometimes our brokenness doesn't have accountability from other people. It's inside and no one else will see it. I bet a lot of you did not know that I had panic attacks when I was pregnant with Lydia. I bet a lot of you didn't know I struggle with stress and anxiety. And I made it that way. I don't, for me, it was lack of trusting in God. It's almightiness to take care of me and relying on my own strength. Brokenness often leads to isolation. Because we don't want people to see it. We build the walls up so high so no one can see what's really going on inside. And as they get closer, the walls get higher and higher and higher until we're in a room of brokenness and we're just stewing in it. And most of the time, that's when we're like, Jesus, we need you. And when we come to the feet, come to his feet and ask him for help. And he will reach down and pull you from that. And healing can take place. And in this process of, um, that I was going through, I realized some things. One, I will never be whole this side of heaven. I will be dealing with some form of brokenness one way or another. So I need to figure out how to live because I'm going to constantly feel like a failure. I'm always going to need God's grace in one form or another. Second thing I realized also that God wants more than just holy people who can quote scripture. He wants whole people too. He wants people who are following him wholeheartedly with every fiber of their being. I'm applying the pressure on us individually, but it affects the church as a whole. Because when his people become holy followers, peoples of him, things change. Because we are living, breathing scripture instead of turning around the scripture we're quoting and tearing down people with the same mouth. And that's not okay. Our foundation is in Christ. And when we get that, we live that the more whole we become. When we become regulars at the feet of Jesus in our brokenness and submit to God, the closer we get to him and ultimately to his people. The isolation goes away. Man, that's what church is supposed to look like. When we submit to God, the more we can honor and see brokenness in other people. We have more compassion, grace, and empathy. For me, it looked like having more grace and compassion to my daughter when her room was a mess. I mean, I tried the whole bin thing, where like each bin was, you know, we had the plush toys here, we had the toys that can travel here, we have the toys that make noise that barely comes out. You know, we had all of that. Well, guess what? Now they're all in different bins (laughs) right now at home. I think about it often. (laughs) But guess what? It's okay. I have way more grace and compassion I did than two years ago when it came to that. And we see it in people all the time, whether that's on social media or at work, something triggers us. 
and we go off. Sometimes, most of the time, it's because we're acting in an unloved space ourselves. But when we can understand how much God loves us and that his love for other people is the same, our relationships with other people change. We have a God who loves and accepts us for who we are. Crazy, messed up, broken. Even your neighbor that's just as crazy, messed up, and broken as you are. You may have the, I got it all together Sunday look. I got that down real good. But God loves you for that face, but also your face in your closet that no one else gets to see. And guys, that matters. There's three points that I want to make about living with this brokenness. I don't do this often, so I don't have fancy, I'll start with a P, little one, two, threes. My points come straight from scripture, and they're in Ephesians chapter four. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when you're studying scripture, you start to move on, and the Lord said, nope, go back. You're not done. And he studies some more, and he's like, nope, go back. You're not done. I've been in Ephesians since November, (laughs) okay? So when Ridge was like, hey, what you going to preach on? I was like, probably going to be Ephesians. (laughs) And so um, we're going to be in Ephesians. And um, in chapters one through three, it talks about what the Lord has done for us. Chapter one, I'm reminded of every, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. And he chose us. We are adopted for his will. We are lavished with grace. We are redeemed and forgiven, and we have a purpose. And I'm reminded of the power of God through Christ. That's just chapter one. (laughs) In chapter two, I'm reminded that um, because of his rich mercy and great love, we are no longer living our old worldly flesh. In chapter three, I'm reminded that salvation through Christ is for everyone. And in chapter four, that's when action happens on our part. And so, um, let's read verse one. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. So my first point, live a worthy life. Now, I'm not talking about your worth that you find on social media. How many likes am I going to get this week? Or things like that. Or maybe your worth in, well, I wonder if my coworkers will like this today. Or how many thank you cards do you think I'm going to get? Or pats on the back or gold stars, whatever it is. I'm not talking about finding your worth in that. But guys, that's hard for me. I'm a people pleaser. Okay? If you didn't already know that about me. But when my desire to please people and get those thank you cards and everything else becomes greater than my desire for the well done, my good and faithful servant at the end of my life, that's a problem. It's a huge problem. A worthy, full life of surrender to the Lord. That's what a worthy life is. But guess what? You got to boast in your weakness. Because when you boast in your weakness, the Lord, everyone else isn't going to see you. They're going to see the Lord. They're not going to be like, oh, Casey did that. They're going to be like, well, the Lord did that because she's crazy. (laughs) And that's what our desire should be. All right, verse two. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Point two, live in confident humility. At the Children's Pastors Conference I went to this last winter, um, Tony Collier was one of the speakers, and she described confident humility like a pendulum. And we need to ride that middle ground. 
Because sometimes we go way too far to one side and we get victimhood real fast. I'm not enough. The Lord can't use me there. Or we go to the other side of pride. Too much confidence. And we're like, oh yeah, I got this. I'm guilty of both. But the Lord wants us to get in that middle. Because we can be confident in who we are in Christ. The Lord tells us, you are not nothing. Because I am king of king and lord of lords and you are my son and daughter and I love you and you are mine and we can have confidence in that and because of that we can humbly serve others we can pull from that confident security secure security Martin Luther King Jr. once said that church was the most segregated hour of the week And it's true. There are hundreds of Baptist churches that meet in Bell County right now. That's just Baptist churches. There's a lot. But also inside of a church building, you also have segregation. You have departments. You have the kids, the youth, the college in the back. You have the older adults, the median adults, the middle adults, the young adults. I'm not going to say those departments are wrong because if they weren't, if they were wrong, I wouldn't have a job. There's a rhyme and reason for them and there's a purpose for them and they're fantastic. But the problem is when we start acting like the Holy Spirit, when we say, oh, well, they're too young to understand what's going to happen here. So they don't need to come. Or maybe I'm too old to make a difference in a young person's life. They, They don't need me. Or this one that, I'm sorry if I step on your toes, but, you know, I haven't been fed much lately. I need to go to service where I can get fed and not go to the kids' class and help once a month. Guys, if that's the problem, it's not at church. (laughs) If this is your only place you're getting fed, we need to open our Bible a little bit more. Sometimes church is segregated because of our brokenness and the walls we build around ourselves. We're either too broken to feel like we could be used somewhere else or people are going to see me as broken so I'm not going to step out of my own house that I've built. Or I'm too comfortable to step outside of my department because it's unknown and scary. But what would church look like if those divisions were gone? If we didn't isolate ourselves and we weren't too proud to serve others because we believe that the Holy Spirit is working everywhere and in everyone. At the Children's Pastors Conference, there was um, a church, a group of their volunteers, and they're all wearing the same shirt. I love that. That's one of those things I love. Matching shirts. And on the back it said, there is no junior Holy Spirit. What? Later, one of the leaders of that church was actually one of the speakers. And she kind of explained it a little bit. And it hit me hard. Because there is only one Holy Spirit. There's only one God And the same God we meet and worship in here is the same God in the kids' area. The same one talking to the youth. The same one talking to our kids in the nursery. The same one that talks to our college students. And it's the same one that meets with you in your home. It's the same one. Yet we don't treat it sometimes like it's the same. I'm guilty of that. Growing up, my anthem verse, it was on my letter jacket, was 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. And I was like, yes! I may be 14, but I'm going to lead vacation Bible school music in an apartment complex. 
I'm a vacation Bible school leader right now, and I'm almost like the idea of a 14-year-old leading music kind of scares me. Somewhere along the line, I forgot to flip to adulthood. My role in that verse is to not look down on anyone who's younger than me. And when I understood this and I grasped that, how I look at my daughter and how I look at our kids here in church changed. Yeah, she's four, but oh my gosh, she can move mountains. These kids that we talk to, it's no longer, well, when you grow up, you can do that. No, it's now. College students, you're about to go summer. It's now, not when you graduate and get a job. The Lord can use you now. Youth, you now, in your school, here at church, because it's the same God we're serving. Nothing's different other than us. Okay, moving on. Sorry. All right, verse three. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Point number three, keep the unity. It says keep, not create. I'm a fixer sometimes, and I like to try to create things to fix it. Thank God I don't have to create unity because I would be bad at it. Our God, our creator, created unity and peace. What that means for us is we get to steward it press into it, and use it. Draw from it. We're the ones that make the divisions happen. Kind of reminds me of a mom who would um, put her two kids in this get-along shirt. I have a picture of one. I don't know if you've seen these. But the goal of that shirt is to bind them together to create peace. And once that they saw that they had unity in their love for their family, they could get out. But that selfishness, power-hungry, pride, sometimes lack of a nap, created divisions and hatred for their brother. And I see that today. I see that in families. I see that in the workplace. And I see that in our churches. I wonder if they make like triple X's in that size so we can get some adults in some of these shirts. I got to ask, are we living a worthy walk in confident humility to be about keeping the unity? As the band walks up, I want to close with the last two verses here. And I'm going to read it over us. So if y'all could just close your eyes. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for a future. Just as you have been called. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Guys, we are tethered in a foundation that is strong. But we can't see it most of the time because we are too focused in our brokenness to see it. God only dwells in the perfect, but we are made perfect through his grace. In our brokenness, we find redemption because we are redeemed. Redeemed and how I love to proclaim it. In our brokenness, we have restoration. We are made new. We are a new creation for the old is gone and the new is here. And in our brokenness, he shows his strength. Because my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Guys, it's okay to be broken. It's okay. But we got to get whole. We can't stay in our brokenness. And we have a God who is enough. 
I'm going to leave you with this statement. Our pursuit for perfection blinds us. But our pursuit for peace in the midst of our brokenness binds us together closer to our king and closer to each other. I don't know where you are today. Maybe your brokenness has you crippled to the point of getting sick. And you need Jesus because he's enough. Or maybe you're trying to ride the struggle bus between confidence and humility. Or maybe you're finding your worth in what other people say about you and not about your calling to God. Maybe your unity in some of your relationships is covered in bitterness, selfishness, pride, anxiety, you name it. Your brokenness is covering it. And that unity is not there. Or maybe some of you have never experienced the grace of Jesus before. I would love to talk to you about that. And if you don't have a church home, this is a good one. I was a member here before I started working here. I love this church. But whatever it is, you come. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you so much for being enough for me. Sometimes, Lord, I forget it. And I let the pressure of the world push on me so much. Thank you for sending your word and your people to love and surround me. Because you are enough. Lord, just help us to live a worthy walk. Follow you with every fiber of our being to what you have called us to do. Help us to serve each other humbly because of who you are and who we are because of who you are. And help us to keep peace between brother and sister. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name.